Hey, Gateway, we're glad you're here today, and uh, all, always we're, we just pray God will bless and encourage you in this whole service of worship. And for those of you who are joining us online, welcome. We're glad you're here with us, uh, whether you're out of town, maybe under the weather, uh, or you're looking at our church, checking out our church online, uh, and wanting to see if this might be a place you want to visit. We hope you'll uh, discover this is a great place uh, these are great folks, it's a great church family, and we'd love for you to come and be with us. This morning we're, we are wrapping up the, the series part. Of course, there's still a lot of stuff going on this week in our groups and all that. But as I was getting ready for it, it, it kind of struck me, it's amazing what kinds of warnings companies sometimes put on their products. For instance, Nitol says, may cause drowsiness. Well, I would hope so. Or on this washing machine, do not put any person in this washer. I mean, this is real. This is a real washer. Or how about this one? On this New Holland tractor, avoid death. Yeah, that's, that's usually something I try to do. Or on this Rowenta iron, it says, do not iron clothes on body. Now, which one of y'all did that? Because somebody must have done that for them to put that warning up there. Um, on this hair dryer, do, do not use while sleeping. I, I, I don't know. Um, in this costume, it says this costume does not enable flight or super strength. <laughs> and, and Doc Thrasher, if you're here this morning, this product is not intended for use as a dental drill. <laughs> Dremel Multi-Pro, not intended for a... I mean, I'm just really grateful he's never used that on me. Uh, and finally, for this chainsaw, do not hold the wrong end of a chainsaw. I mean, I don't know. Um, some warnings are just kind of crazy. But some really do matter. Some really do save our lives. And that's good for us to consider as we wrap up this Last Sunday message in our series, Heaven on Earth. But again, we've got the, the reading still all this week in our journals, and it's not too late. If you haven't done it, you can still get one of these. You can still read this week's worth. It will be worth it. Uh, we've got our small groups and watching the video that will go into some uh, more detail in some of this. And of course, then a lot of our groups still are working on their all-out serve. Uh, uh, one of my... my, my Life group's already done it, but the men's group, we're going to be doing something next Saturday. So throughout the Sermon on the Mount, that is Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, Jesus has been painting this picture for his disciples, those who really choose to follow him, of what living in the kingdom of heaven or living in the kingdom of God looks like. And we've said all through this that the, the, what the Bible teaches is that the kingdom of God is wherever God reigns. And in Jesus, God completely reigned. So the kingdom has come fully in Jesus. And he was preaching about it and inviting his listeners to faith in him in order to enter the kingdom and then to imitate him as to how to live the life of the kingdom going forward. And he's laid out some pretty challenging stuff. I mean, we've gone through here and looked at, at you know, love your enemies. And you've heard it said uh, uh, about not murder, but the problems with anger. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here that's very, very challenging that pushes Jesus's listeners, his followers, his disciples then and today to put it all on the line, to, in other words, put up or shut up. And to make that clear, Jesus concludes with a, a short parable that a lot of us have heard, but I want us to look at it uh, this morning. So I invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verse 24 through 27. You can also use the YouVersion Bible app. And if you have neither of those, we've got uh, printed notes in the bulletin that you can use. It has the scriptures and places for notes. So this is what Jesus says. And these are the last words he says as a part of the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, so in, on, on top of all of these teachings he's been giving us through these three chapters, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, now notice it's not just hear them, but puts them into practice, 
That, he said, that person is the wise person who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, we know that Jesus was a carpenter, and, and so he knew how to build stuff, and that most likely included houses. In the hills and, and mountains of, of Palestine, and, and if you, Palestine, if you look at the topography map or whatever, fairly level ground was not that common. So when a man found flat ground, his temptation would be to build right on top of that. But if he didn't look at the whole picture, if he didn't consider what could happen in the future, he might settle for the first flat ground he found. The potential problem was that if he found an area of level ground that was apparently a part of a dried up stream or riverbed called a wadi, he might be tempted to build there because it would be easy. It, 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 would, it wouldn't be any problem. But he might not be considering the consequences of that choice. If he did examine the ground and, or didn't examine the ground and the season very carefully, what looked great in the spring or the summer could be horrible during the winter rainy season. And, and we've learned some of that the hard way here in Houston through floods like Harvey. Water has incredible power. Yeah, now, admittedly, rain is a regular part of our lives around here. And over time, our real battle is rising water. But in arid and desert settings, like we're talking about here, what Jesus is talking about, where rain is so much more rare, when it comes, it can create flash floods that have this incredible power. In fact, you can get flash floods in areas that did not even get rain, that are down, down slope from where this occurred. And I, I came across a video, and this is just uh, from the United States, so, but the terrain is very similar. And what I want you to see is there's all this wondrous, wonderful flat ground all through here um, and, and, and throughout that looks great. In fact, nice, n nice waterfront view, right? Now watch what happens. This is an actual flash flood from rains that were about 20 miles away. It did not rain here. This is debris that's been caught up in the water. And at first it looks like it's mainly an issue for the river channel. But watch what keeps happening. It's spreading all through. Look at the speed and the force of the water. And guys, we're talking about a minute so far, maybe. Can you imagine having built something right over in here and how it might have survived or not? I mean, and, and that's, that's real life. One minute, everything's fine. Everything looks fine. Nothing happened around you. And in the next, water is rushing in and destroying everything in the path. I mean, the power of water is incredible. You know, they, they talk about... Um, when they're talking about floods, they you know, turn around, don't drown. And people think, oh, I, I can get through. I, I can't remember the exact figure, but I think at about six or eight inches of water, there is enough force to float a, a vehicle. So we have to understand there's, there is huge power here. And 
That's more like the experiences that Jesus and his, his, his listeners knew than our, our rising water from, from Harvey. The storm comes, and it, and it may not seem like a, a, a lot in, in your setting, but the water collects in those washes, and before you know it, you have this powerful flood knocking aside everything in its path, including things that you thought were safe. And so as Jesus concludes his teachings on life in the kingdom of heaven, he offers his listeners then and today a, a, a real warning. What he's telling us is that this stuff in chapters 5, 6, and 7 is not theoretical. It's not pie in the sky. It's not something that might happen to some people someday. It is about real life. Storms come, period. The only real question is, have we built our house, have we built our lives on something that can withstand the storm or are we in danger of seeing everything washed away? And, and Jesus' point here is that having an inadequate foundation, building your life on the wrong things, most of the time, at the time you're doing it, may not seem like a big deal. In fact, it's usually easier. It's more convenient. It's, it's not a big deal. And if you could see the future and you knew you'd never encounter a storm, fine. No problem. But that's the problem with storms. Most of the time, we don't see them coming. We don't see them until they break over us. You know, when Harvey first formed, most of us know, no one was imagining that the Houston area would have 40 to 60 inches of rain dumped on it. And yet a week later, how, how our lives had changed. Everything we'd planned had been thrown out the window as we dealt with the storm. I, I've done so many funerals, so many, more than I care to count, of people who were, who were fine one moment, and then there's a car wreck, or there's a bad decision, or there's a heart attack, and life's over. I mean, we have folks in our church family right now who are in the hospital who didn't see it coming a month ago or maybe even a week ago. I was talking to one of our members last week whose family had just experienced a tragedy, and, and he said to me, Randy, what do people do who don't have the hope of Jesus Christ in their lives when this kind of thing happens? Because one minute his life was fine and literally within five minutes his whole world was turned upside down just a few years ago i, I went to a chiropractor because i had a crick in my neck that didn't seem to go away and within 24 hours we discovered that i had a mass in my chest that turned out to be a thyroid cancer mass and my life was forever changed about 20 years ago i woke up on a sunday morning getting ready to preach. I wasn't feeling great, but I thought I could push through. But by that night, I was in critical condition in the hospital with a severe case of bacterial meningitis. Now, obviously I survived, okay? I'm here. But I tell you, both of those experiences changed my life and, and the lives of those close to me. In fact, both of those experiences had an effect on my, the churches I served. And I guarantee you, I did not see either of those events coming. And of course, some of you are thinking, I'm staying away from him. He's unlucky. <laughs> I don't have anything to do with him, with that guy. But here's the thing. If, if, for any of us, if we live life any length of time, sooner or later, a storm's going to come. A lot of you can point to storms that have been going on in your life that have happened or that are breaking on you right now. Maybe it's our health. But maybe it's a job or, or a relationship or a family crisis because storms aren't li limited to physical health. The point Jesus is making here is that when the storm comes, and it will come, have you, have I, have we built our lives on a foundation that can withstand the storm? And again, it doesn't mean there won't be any damage. But as you saw from the flood video, if you built in the wrong place, the issue isn't how bad the damage is going to be. The issue is going to be, is there anything left to go back to, including your life? So 
Some scholars think that Jesus had in mind an Old Testament proverb when he, he told this parable, because in Proverbs 10, 25, it says, when the storms of life come, notice, it doesn't say if the storms of life come. It says when the storms of life come, the wicked are whirled away, but the godly have a lasting foundation. And as Jesus demonstrated over and over again, he didn't come to do away with the Old Testament, but to fulfill it, to make it even more true for our own lives. And he knew that too many people were building their lives then and now on foundations that won't last, that cannot protect them from the storms of life. Over 700 years before the time of Jesus, the Jewish leaders believed that their kingdom was secure, but, but, but they weren't building their foundation on God at that point. They were really kind of building on their own strength and on other gods, in fact. And so God sent the prophet Isaiah to warn them. And in Isaiah 28, ver, beginning in verse 16, Isaiah records what God said. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look. I'm placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It's a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes need never be shaken. I will test you with the measuring line of justice and the plumb line of righteousness. Since your refuge is made of lies, a hailstorm will knock it down. Since it's made of deception, a flood will sweep it away. I will cancel the bargain you made to cheat death, and I will overturn your deal to dodge the grave. When the terrible enemy sweeps through, you will be trampled into the ground. Again and again, that flood will come morning after morning, day and night, until you are carried away. The cornerstone. Um, if, if some of you know this, but a cornerstone was essentially the first stone placed in those times in a building. And obviously, it's often the biggest stone, and so where you put it determines where you build. If you put your cornerstone on a sandy sh- spot, well, you're going to build from there. If you put it on a solid spot, you're going to build from there. It, 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 and in the bad, worst place, the bad spots, the structure was doomed. But the right cornerstone in the right place assured the best possible foundation. Well, just over 100 years after Isaiah issued his warning about using the right cornerstone, many of us know Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians and the temple was destroyed. Nothing man-made can ultimately stand the eternal tests of time. But, but Isaiah wasn't pointing to a building. He was actually pointing to a person. And after Jesus' death and resurrection, the apostle Peter and the other apostles recognized that Isaiah, in fact, back then had been talking about Jesus. And Peter writes in his first letter, he, he writes, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. God's temple, we would learn, is the body of Christ. He says he was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you're his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, And here we go back to Isaiah. I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yet you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, another quote, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they don't obey God's word. And so they meet the fate of that was planned for them. Guys, the Bible tells us over and over and over again that there is no other foundation that any human being can build their life upon that will stand the tests of time other than Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews said he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I mean, these are statements about the immovability, the solidness, the foundation that's being built here. And these guys didn't reach that conclusion in a brainstorming session one afternoon. They didn't say, hey, let's come up with a great saying or a great idea. 
through decades and centuries of real life experience proving over and over again that Jesus' life, teachings, death, and resurrection is the only foundation God has given us to stand against any of the storms that life will bring. All Scripture from the Old Testament and forward pointed to Jesus as the fulfillment of everything God was doing. He was, he was the embodiment of the kingdom of heaven. His life perfectly reflected life in heaven here on earth. And so he is the foundation that all of us need to build our lives upon. His life, his teachings, his love show us how to be kingdom people. So we begin to experience some of heaven here on earth ourselves. And again, remember, experiencing heaven on earth doesn't mean life is all good. It means in the midst of what's going on, in the midst of the storms, we have a peace that passes all understanding. We have a hope that nothing in this world can take away from us. And because he is the foundation, the cornerstone, if we aren't building on him, at some point, maybe not now, maybe not for weeks, maybe not for years, but at some point we're going to get blown out of the water by a storm and it will often be a storm we didn't see coming and at that point just remember at that point it's really kind of late to start working on your foundation it, it I'm not saying it won't help but it won't help much so the time to build your foundation is now when you know a storm will come at some point even if it's not here now but then again, for some of you, it may be here now. It's like the old saying, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. But the next best time is today. In other words, we can all look at our lives, we can look back, we can say, I wish I would have done this, I wish I had spent more time, great, fine. We can all do that. We can play the what-if game until the cows come home. But it doesn't change anything. But you can start now with whatever you have in whatever place you are and begin. You and I have to be building that foundation now so that it will be ready when storms come. You know, there's been a, a lot of study on what's been called the Ike Dyke or the coastal spine to protect our area from the flooding of future hurricanes. Uh, but it's called the Ike Dyke. Some of you will know this, but some of you especially may be newer in the area because in 2008 when Hurricane Ike struck, there was no dike, as there still isn't. There was no protection from the storm, and it did billions of dollars of damage here. Well, the reality is we can't change that. We can't go back and say, oh, I wish we would have built... 20 years ago or 30 years ago an Ike Dyke or whatever you want to call it. But we can learn from it. We can move forward and be better prepared, both for hurricanes here along the Texas Gulf Coast, but especially for storms in our lives. Now is the time for each of us to be building our foundation on Jesus Christ. And as a church, we are here to help each one of us build that foundation on Jesus that will enable you to stand the storms of life as they come. Again, uh, stand the storm of life doesn't mean you're going to stand back and say, oh, that was so much fun. I, let's do that again. <laughs> I don't know of anybody really who would say, I'd love for Harvey to hit again. But God worked in the midst of it and did some amazing things for those who put their faith and trust in him. And so building a foundation is the work we're called to do. You, you, you can't just say, I'm going to lay this one plank down, and that's sufficient. Because planks rot over time. Building a foundation is an ongoing task. It takes work. It takes time. It's spending daily time in God's Word and prayer. It, it, it's being involved in environments that Gateway offers of worship and serving and, and groups to experience biblical community, to encourage and lift one another up. And yet, that, again, won't mean it'll be easy or you won't have any problems. But by, by seeking to live for the kingdom of heaven, 
you will be so much better prepared than before. And those of us who have experienced those things with Christ can testify that he gives us the resources, the inner strength, the peace, whatever it is you may need to enable you to overcome whatever life throws at you. Jesus said, this is what the wise person does. They listen, they learn, and then they choose to build correctly on him and on his authority. And here's the thing, if we are following Jesus' lead, then like him, then we also try to help others build wisely too. It's not simply about me and for me. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In fact, by helping others build, and, and I... I I can't fully explain this, and I think it's only God understands this, but somehow we end up building our own foundations, our own lives stronger as we take the focus off ourselves, off me, and instead look to others to unleash God's love into their lives. But it all begins with building our lives on the right foundation, on the right cornerstone. And so as we wrap up this series and we wrap up this this whole movement of God, I'm convicted and convinced that he led us to the Sermon on the Mount. He he, he is pointing us to the kingdom because it matters how you and I as a church go forward. It matters how we live our lives that we don't come, become complacent, we don't become satisfied. We are here to, to be a part of God's kingdom, to help build the kingdom, to be his, his tools in His hands. And yes, it means we do have to build foundations for us to work from. But from there, to go and make disciples. Because Jesus says He has all the authority.